Welcome to Worship of Our Lord here at Oregon Lutheran Church, and welcome home. Please rise as you are able, so that we may begin worship and confession in the way of the cross. We are gathered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Make us to know your ways, O Lord, and teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth, and teach us. For you are the God of our salvation, for whom we wait. Amen. If we say we have fellowship with God while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not live according to the truth. But if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions, wash us thoroughly from our iniquity, and cleanse us from our sin. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation, and uphold us with a willing spirit. Let it be known to you that through Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. He commanded us to preach and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and of the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For the Lord most high is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty, eternal God, increase in us your gifts of faith, hope, and love. And in order that love may abide in us, help us to celebrate what your love has done for us. Grant this, we pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
kiddos. Oh, I hope there's 27 of you. Let's just, just like it was last week. Come on up. I'd even settle for 30. And some of you will grab those trays where the first fruits have been left. That would be great. Come on up here. Come on up all the way up. Last week we were different because we had book bags, but come on up. The closer you get to the altar, the closer you are to me. Come on up this way. I promise I don't bite. Oh, yeah. All good. Come on up this way, fellas. I want to ask you, what do you see on the very front row up there? What's over there? Do you know? Hmm? Presents. They kind of look like presents. They are going to be gifted to people. Do you know what's in those bags and boxes over there? Who's wearing tennis shoes today? I got some really funky shoes on today, but you'll know more about that in a minute. You got tennis shoes on. Oh, bright turquoise ones. Those are cool. Okay. You do. I see that. You know, there's a bunch of tennis shoes up here, and you know where they're going? To, pe to people who need them. We're calling it soul care, and it is a wonderful thing to do to make sure that other people who don't have tennis shoes can get them for their school year. And so it's a wonderful thing. We love God, and we love other people. And so it's really, really important for us to be able to provide things for other people. Today's lesson is not a great text for homecoming for most people, but I think it's fabulous. And the reason why is Jesus is saying, you know what? Don't let anything or anybody stand in your way of loving God and loving all my other people. That's a message that we should carry every single day. So here we go. Because we love God, we organize doing something like that so that other people will know who God is and know that somebody loves them, that God loves them, and that we love them. Don't you think that's a good idea? I think that's an excellent idea. Miss Rita, why don't you come up and tell them some other ways that we're going to show God and show other people that we love Him and we love them. Good morning, everybody. Um, on top of the, pre the preacher's children's sermon here, um, we just want to introduce something new that our church is starting. Um, if you're not aware here at Oregon Youth and Church, we have two amazing youth groups. So if anyone is interested, feel free to find me after church if you want to talk about it. Um, we have OKFC, which is kindergarten or younger. We have some preschoolers, kindergarten through fifth grade. And our Luther League is middle and high school. So we've been talking a lot at our meetings and things, what we can do, what our children can do for the church. Um, we've decided that our families here are very fortunate. And we have decided, as our youth groups, we are starting a brand new outreach program. And that is going to be a Christmas Angels toy shop. And I have some older kids that are now are going to pass out some pamphlets that kind of tells you everything about what we're going to do. Um, we are going to collect new and gently used toys. Um, so if you, anybody throughout the year, we're going to do this year round. It's something just getting started brand new. So it's kind of new and we're kind of treading the waters. But we're going to start collecting toys. And then at Christmas, we're going to open the shop for four Saturdays and be able for families to come shop for free. Um, to be able to help families that need help at Christmas with toys. Um, and this is going to be run by our youth. Um, we've done a lot of talking. It's going to be housed in the parsonage. That parsonage on the top floor of the parsonage. Um, and it's going to um, open for four Saturdays in November and December. And we hope this is the beginning of a new yearly tradition. And we also, our goal is to keep it open during the year. So families maybe that have birthdays, Things that come open during the year, we can open it up once a month to help them if they need help with presents at round birthdays and things like that. So what you're getting right now is the basic information of everything that the toy shop is going to have. Um, it is Christmas Angels Toy Shop, and if you look, it spells cats. So there's a cute little cat at the top. Um, so inside, it tells a little bit about our youth, how you can help. So if you're cleaning out, if your kids are like my kids, toys hardly get touched. Um, we'll take those, clean them up, repurpose them, and we'll put them in the Christmas toy shop at Christmas time. So anytime you have something maybe that you're ready to donate, 
Um, feel free to find me, give it to a youth or their family, or the youth has a new office um, across from the main office down the hallway. So things can be dropped off there. Um, ask friends and family if they have anything they need to donate. Like I said, it's going to be a year-long process. Um, if you know any businesses that would be willing to help with our new outreach program, I do have a letter. So just find me, and I'll be happy to get you a copy of that letter. Um, and the contact information um, and my name and numbers on the back, too. So if you have any questions, just feel free to find me. Find a youth member. Um, did everybody get a pamphlet? Okay, like I said, this is new. Um, our kids are really excited about it. Um, we hope to be this to be the first year of many years to come. Um, so I just appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. So you know how excited you get when you get a new gift, something new to play with or something new to do, or maybe a craft kit or something, or a puzzle. Yeah, I get excited about that, too. You guys are so blessed, and we're so grateful. We're sharing what we've got with other people who may or may not know that anybody cares, and that's a big deal. So what we're also going to do is ask those of you with plates to stand up and turn around. We're going to offer first fruits that way to our Lord and ask Him to divide and multiply those gifts as well. Congregation, please join us in the offering prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, power, glory, victory, and majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Who am I and what is this people that we should be able to bring you an offering? For all things come from you and from what is your own we have given you. Amen. Thank you so much. If you'll take plates back, you know where the stuff is on the front pew. I'm so glad to see you this homecoming. Come back. Love to see you every week. Our first reading today <clears throat> is from the 23rd chapter of Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, It shall be well with you, and to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word? Or who has paid attention to his word and listened? Behold the storm of the Lord. Wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places, so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do I not feel heaven and earth, declares the Lord. I have heard what the prophets have said, who prophesied lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall there be lies in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies, and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart, who think to make my people forget my name by their dreams, that they tell one another, even, if they're, even as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream. 
But let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, declares the Lord, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us read responsively Psalm 119. My soul has longed for your salvation. I have put my hope in your word. My eyes have failed from watching for your prophets, and I say, when will you comfort me? I have become like a leather flask in the smoke, but I have not forgotten your statutes. How much longer must I wait? When will you give judgment against those who persecute me? The proud have dug pits for me. They do not keep your law. All your commandments are true. Help me, for they persecute me with lies. They had almost made an end of me on earth, but I have not forsaken your commandments. In your loving kindness revive me, that I may keep the decrees of your mouth. Our second reading today is from the 11th chapter of Hebrews. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. The Word of God. Thanks be to God. Please rise as you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the twelfth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? 
No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one house there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Gnade zu erz und Friede von Gott, und sehr und Vater und dem Herrn Jesus Christus. Amen. Zert, stehlen Sie mein Ansehen. Ich bin gerade auf mein Pferd gefahren. <laughs> oh, sorry, I slipped back into German there for just a minute. Uh, allow me to try it again in English. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Pardon my appearance, I just rode in on my horse. Reverend Adolphus Nussman, Adolf to most, thank you for allowing me to deliver a word from God's word today at this Zion's homecoming. It is a unique experience to be sure in this newer space. It's lovely, this beautiful, peaceful setting. We glorify God that this church has survived and thrived for so many years. Some churches do not survive at all. Or they become museums, as is the case in many of my fatherland churches. In the new world, we all knew how rare Oregon's kind of longevity is. How exactly does that happen? How did we get here today? So if you do not know the history or you need a brush up, a refresher, here it is. Refugees from the Rhine River Valley of Germany tried to escape religious persecution by traveling to the New World. You see, just as your beautiful musical offering pointed out, we yearn for home. A place where we are comfortable. Because many things of this life can make us tired, weak, and worn. Persecution for your beliefs will do that. Wear upon our very souls. And those who broke away from the Roman Catholic Church and the Reformation, or those who had access to Scripture for the first time, used the firepower of the Holy Spirit to lead them in new ways. That's how we got here. And that's not easy. It's usually quite difficult because there's this new thing that is happening with surprises in store. And those who do not submit to human power and control over the Word of God often find themselves in some uncomfortable positions. It was time to explore new lands, time to start over, to begin anew. It was scary. It comes with many challenges and difficult changes. German pioneers who had issues finding good farmland got word that Carolina soil would be better than Pennsylvania or New York. So the great wagon road and the old Indian trading path to Bladen County, North Carolina, became a primitive route for many German Reformed settlers to tackle. They arrived in what are currently Cabarrus and Rowan counties in 1728. Church services were held in barns. And as soon as houses <clears throat> were built, schools became the focus with the basis for all education for all children being Christian faith fundamentals, biblical knowledge, reading, writing, and arithmetic. European Bibles, catechisms, and hymnals were brought with them from the fatherland, and they were actively used every day in the New World. Faith studies were considered as essential as farming implements. They were necessary for survival. Dutch meeting houses began popping up all over this area with markers for those resting in the peace of God surrounding them. And the community leader or school teacher was responsible for holding services. And there were no regular pastors of permanence as you know them now. 
there were German Reformed and more rarely Lutheran pastors. Martin Luther would have hated that term, but that's okay. They would pass through between Pennsylvania and Charleston, South Carolina, and tend the flocks as they could and administer the sacraments. Sometimes an agreement would be reached for a particular spiritual leader to attend a designated area. In 1771, Lutherans and German Reformed peacefully separated. <laughs> That's how it's recorded anyway. And as more and more immigrants arrived here, there were more and more needs for stationary religious leadership. Now, Christopher Lavrul, later Lyerly, from St. John's in the country, just over there about 15 minutes by car. Must be nice. And Christopher Rentelman, later Randleman, from this church, were commissioned to go at their own expense to Germany to seek out a minister and a teacher. Governor Tryon wrote a letter of recommendation to the Society for the Spread of the Gospel in Foreign Parts in London along with a petition by 60 families and other credentials. The two Christophers rode from, from here to Charleston on horseback, and then they sold their horses to buy their passage to England. The Mission Society, the King of England and his friends, and St. James Lutheran Chapel in London combined their resources and pooled them for an $800 gift to help those men in their mission. In Hanover, Germany, they were granted permission to call and commission Mr. Johann Gottfried Ahrens as a school teacher. He's on this monument out here. And me as pastor, also on the beautiful monument out there. So you can read all about us on that lovely monument that this church saw fit to install in the median in the parking lot. After coming through London and Charleston, South Carolina from Germany, I became North Carolina's first Lutheran minister. And my first sermon was preached on the second Sunday of August, 1773, right here at Zion, or as you refer to it, Oregon. There's some history there that will be revealed on Heritage Sunday in the old church in September. You won't want to miss that. We'll all be there, I pray, because it's not been discussed before. So Heritage Sunday in September. My first year, my full efforts were given to this church, but I also served St. John's Mecklenburg, which is now Cabarrus, it oozes, and other groups of folks where I could. I'm amazed, flabbergasted really, to be called upon to deliver today's message, and I am astounded to see the monument outside. Why? Folks here in that day wanted a pastor desperately. They just did not want a pastor who was trained as a Franciscan, and I was. So there was a bit of a revolt, which is a gracious construction. All due respect. And I am honored to be welcomed here this day. But in that day, I was dismissed because of the very training that had developed me as a pastor. So I must thank you and your predecessors for installing such a lovely tribute to Teacher Aaron's and myself. Perhaps folks became tired of being tired, weak, and worn and decided that that particular history in this place, both in its glory and in its shame, as everyone has, warranted an acknowledgement, and a letting go. I am moved and appreciative to know that particular part of our history together has healed over the years. In 1774, I moved to Mecklenburg County and became the first regular pastor of St. John's, just over there, and that would eventually be my resting place. I served there for 20 years, but I rode a route of 50 to 60 miles around this area helping other congregations get started. That sounds like a lot, but I was originally tasked with 700 miles of territory all on horseback. That pastoring experience saw us through the Revolutionary War just three years after I started. We suffered a lot in those years. And many of the parishioners were wounded and killed in British prisons, thanks to the Tories. During the War for Independence, I was a Whig, standing for the cause of the colonies. 
had the fire of the Holy Spirit not been with me as I served, I would not have been able to endure what the Tories and their native allies did to me. This is my testimony. They used burning splinters in some of my most vulnerable physical spots, including my throat, which has been suspected as the eventual cause of my death to throat cancer. They used a red-hot iron on me, trying to coerce me away from my cause for liberty. They wanted to make a shaming example out of a man of God. Break him, and you'll break the others. I must admit to you that on many occasions, Lord, forgive me. I hid. I hid out rather than standing boldly in plain sight because I did fear for my life. To protect their territories and their farms, many of our own parishioners stayed home on Sundays, which took a tremendous toll on church life. I sent pleas to Hanover for personnel and financial support, but none of it got to us during those years. It was rough. It wasn't until the war was over that help came from Helmstadt, not Hanover. Probably because George III belonged to Hanover, where success for rebellion was not very well received. Ah, politics. Reverend Carl Storch of Helmstadt stayed with me in the autumn of 1788 serving this congregation and three others for 41 years. And eventually, three more pastors were sent to be helpful, and Reverend Christian Eberhardt Bernhardt of Stuttgart began to serve this parish in 1800. So that's my time frame. And with due glory and honor to our Lord and Savior, St. John Cabarrus became the center of Lutheranism in North Carolina, and I became the supervisor for the entire North Carolina mission of 20 congregations supplying them as best I could with word and sacrament, training others. What an honor. With the Lord's guidance, we trained and supplied over 30 pastors in short order, earning St. John's the reputation of being the strongest Lutheran congregation in the state. In 1803, pastors and delegates met at the Old Pine Church and formed the North Carolina Synod, which is modern-day Union Lutheran Church, where your current pastor and my descendant, Tanya Kessler Britton, was raised in the faith. We're all connected. In fact, right here at Oregon, the North Carolina Synod accepted St. John in 1806. So Oregon, this church body, had an awful lot to do with the training and formation of strong, strong Lutheranism throughout the entire state. How stunned I am. It's really unbelievable to know that this historic church saw fit to call a female to minister to you as she asked God to guide you according to his will. Now, some may hear all of that and think, okay, great history, so what? At my history lesson, what does that have to do with me today and tomorrow? What does that have to do with our future? For that, and so that I appear not only as a historian today, but as the preacher I was called to be, let us return to the gospel text. There is no history in all of creation without conflict, none without discord. How can I put a gracious construction upon this? There's no history without the Holy Spirit's fire being necessary to keep Christ's church strong and viable, refreshed and moving, long-standing, in order for us all to be able to be at home this homecoming in Christ's church. We cannot afford to allow ourselves to be tired, weak, or worn, but rather dependent upon God's Spirit to lead our own in His ways no matter what comes. Now, Jesus knew he was on his way to Jerusalem. He also knew he was going to die there. So there was an urgency in his speech and his explanations to his disciples. When we know we have a limited amount of time to convey a very strong message, we are much more blunt, at least I am, in getting that message across. Jesus' bluntness 
may read as cold or harsh, but he didn't have time to spare. Jesus' holy time clock was ticking, and he needed to prepare the disciples as efficiently as possible. His passion was coming, so he spoke passionately about their need to understand the ways of his kingdom. They would need holy determination. They would need conviction to be able to do what must be done in Jesus' name for his kingdom. Now you may hear, don't let your fear get in the way of your faith. Prayerfully, we also read that we are to fear the Lord. When we respect God's authority and submit to his word, we are not as easily swayed by those things or people who would try to come between us and God's will. And when we can healthily separate out our fears from our faith, those that we love who do not fear the Lord at all can become distant. Our relationships can falter or suffer in some way. We think we're in crisis when that happens. We don't like how that feels. We want the comfort of home. And scripture tells us repeatedly, choose this day whom you will serve. With very plain language about narrow gates and such. Yet somehow the things of God can take a backseat to many other things of this world and I understand yours moves very quickly compared with mine. When that happens, whether we like it or not, anything can become an idol, something in the way. There's no room for idols when leaving your homeland for the new world to shape future generations in faithful communities. There's no wiggle room there. You're either going or you're staying home. There's no room for idols as you endure torture because you will not denounce your Lord for anybody. God will get his mission accomplished, even when congregations dismiss pastors, when pastors die of throat cancer, and when entire church bodies must separate themselves from others because opinions have become more important than God's word and his will. There is no room for idols at any point in history at the present time or in the future that awaits us, we will need him forever. As my religious freedoms were at risk in Germany, I had to allow God to control and move me however he saw fit. I had to be pliable. I had to listen and respond with action by leaving everything I knew, everything that was comfortable to me, trusting that God would provide in a whole new land where I would encounter God knew what, God knew where, for God knew who long, how long that was going to take. It was just, who knew? That alone came with risks. It came with elimination of things in my life that could have easily become idols. I could have refused to take the call to be here. My own inaction causing a delay could have harmed this church very much. The things that we do not consider to be stumbling blocks to ministry can easily be if we allow ourselves to be directed by someone other than the Lord. Who really wants to leave their family and everything they know to follow Jesus to unfamiliar and scary territory? That's so uncomfortable. It's a divide of something that we don't easily separate, something that is considered wholesome and formative. We associate our beliefs within our family structures so often. But is that always the path that God has for us if he uses us for his glory and the expansion of his kingdom? Now your current pastor tells jokes about Rowan County family trees having no branches and being telephone poles, whatever those things are. But in my day, we might have considered what I had to do to propagate faith in Jesus as tree splitting. It was truly mission work. New land, new territory, new war, new agreements, new everything, all for the sake of God's kingdom. It is difficult to say the gospel of our Lord after reading this particular lesson that speaks to us of things that do not sound very hopeful. The tearing apart or redirection of our most intimate relationships, including our families, really? That doesn't sound like the gospel of our Lord should sound in our ears. And yet there it is. Right in his word for us to digest. Jesus spoke of families being divided, those tender, valued relationships that we share, of being split over the crises and disruption of who he is, whose we are, 
and what he requires of us. It is similar to when my descendant, your current pastor, asked a young man if the woman that he loved and intended to marry loved Jesus more than him. <laughs> you should have seen the look on his face. He was taken aback at first. But the more he thought about it, and about all of the lifetime together trials that they were probably going to face, the more he appreciated the question that was presented to him. It seemed so callous and so unkind. In any and all of our relationships, what we learn from Jesus Christ is the most valuable piece of it all. Jesus of Nazareth was making a difference and splitting trees of familiarity all over the place, even family trees. You know that if you read Scripture. Those who understood faith in our Lord being the most important aspect of life itself would have peace and harmony, at least here. Unity. But for those who split hairs over their beliefs about who He is and what they were willing to do to follow Jesus, the tree splitting would definitively come. And Jesus' sense of urgency on His way to Jerusalem told everybody within earshot of Him to immediately attend to their relationships with God with all other details being secondary, even their most intimate human relationships. Bless you. Jesus already told us to love God more than anything else and our neighbor as ourselves. And we cannot do that effectively if we're paying more attention to hair splitting than holy tree splitting. So here's a good question. You've got some horticulturists out there. We, we dealt with trees some yesterday. What actually causes a tree to split? What causes that? An incident or an accident or wind or lightning perhaps? What about those trees that have received no trauma and split anyway? Like ministers who are called to leave everything they know to pastor people in a faraway new land. The most common cause of tree splits is from frost cracking and sun scald. It's a combo thing. Sun scalding most often occurs on the south, the southwest side of tree trunks on these very young trees with thin bark. And on a warm winter day, the direct sun's heat warms up the surface of that bark. And then later that night, these areas rapidly refreeze. So it's a combination of a form of water, frost, and a form of fire, sun. Tree splitting doesn't normally cause the death of a tree. But it does cause redirection in how the branches grow. Young trees with tender bark get reshaped by the combination of water and fire. Here you go, Pastor Nussman. They get reshaped with the combination of water and fire. The status quo of relationships gets disrupted, and we don't want to think that Jesus himself might be the source of that. We don't like thinking of ourselves as young trees with thin bark that gets reshaped by fire and water, especially if that means that we are getting redirected in some way. But your church history depended on that. Jesus defines relationship with him through the elements of water, baptism, and fire, Holy Spirit interaction. Jesus knew he would endure a terrible experience full of tension, until he passed through it and emerged from it in triumph. So the concept of keeping the way of the cross ever before his eyes was so different than that Jewish idea of God's king with drawn sword ready to tackle. Our king is the real deal. And that's why some folks detest Christianity. Belief in Jesus Christ is more powerful than anything that non-believers know, including the power of earthly relationships. Repeatedly, Christians had to decide whether their family unit or their location or their vocation or some other really big component in life leveraged against their faith was loved more than Jesus. And when we claim Christianity, we state with loyalty to Christ that takes precedence over the deepest loyalties we can conjure up. God knew that it would take fortitude. God knew it would take conviction. God knew it would take Holy Spirit involvement to form churches in the new world. 
God knew it would require a faith that could withstand the effects of war, of torture from the enemy, of building new starts with growing communities, he knew it would take learning to communicate and meet one another's needs in a foreign territory. That's not easy. God knew that at any point in history, at any point in your life today, and at any point in the future, anything that is allowed to come between God and us is not healthy nor advisable. God knew that you would need faithful pastors to remind you of that, no matter what you or they were going through. God knew. And God knows that our future church at Oregon is able to celebrate its history for years far beyond what you will see in your lifetimes. Far beyond. Faithfulness is not an option. Not everything will be comfortable to be able to make that happen. Now, hopefully, you will not see a war like I saw. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. But you have seen folks avoid church on Sunday and for reasons much more trivial than protection of their homesteads during the Revolutionary War. Hopefully, you will not run into the situation of having to wait for a visiting pastor on a rotation of 60 miles to attend to your needs. But there are churches in this county that are in that very situation without leadership or spiritual guidance. Pastors are quitting and retiring, and we need to raise up more of them. And to do that, they need to be raised in our churches, at least partially. Hopefully, and most importantly, your children will know without a doubt that you were raised to believe in Christ and will know the eternal security they have in their living Lord, Jesus. But it will take the actions of a convicted family and the witness of the faithful community to help bring that about. In my day, we made biblical instruction and study the most important part of any education, whether we got the rest or not. Can we say that today? And if we cannot say that in our educational settings, can we say that in our own homes? Can we say that in our churches? Can Oregon Lutheran Church confidently say that homecoming 2075 will happen because we've raised up the next generation of believers in the faith with a conviction so strong that they would be willing to sacrifice anything for it. That they would put their own lives on the line for it. How about 2090? When we see our children heading into something that's not good for them, hopefully we have the conviction to say so. And when Christ said what was coming for God's children... He said so with urgency and love and his very life on the line. Jesus did not mince words. He said so. He said it would not be easy. He told us bluntly where our loyalty should lie. And he did not turn away from the issues of the tree splitting, the fire and the frost, to make his point in families, biological or otherwise. Most importantly, Jesus did not avoid his own sacrifice in tree splitting of the holiest kind, in order to make himself more comfortable. Jesus told it like it was, like it or not. Jesus bore our sins upon himself and died and rose so that his holy cross tree splitting would cover our human hair splitting with grace and mercy. By water and fire, Jesus prepared the way for us to be in this world without being of this world. By baptism into him and through the work of his Holy Spirit, we are brought into relationship with him in the heavenly realm for all of eternity. So this homecoming today, remember this. God provides for his people always. God's people, through making God their priority, receive the benefit of what he provides. God provides a new home for his people in the new world. God provides a way for his people to be fed when they hunger for faith families. God provides for his church when they stand their ground in obedience to his word. God is providing for you right here, right now. God provided Jesus for you. His most precious gift. God provides ways for us to be in communion with him and his lives in the church. God provides holy water and holy fire. It forms our heritage. 
By following His direction in the present with faithful conviction, we can provide for our children and our grandchildren and our great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren and folks who would not ever know the love of Jesus Christ without our words and actions pointing them in His direction with everything they need. All of those folks deserve to know and need to know and will benefit eternally from knowing that Jesus will carry their futures in his security and his love forever. That is real homecoming. And for that, we give thanks to God. Amen. persons desire to affirm their baptism and become disciples of Christ with membership at Oregon Lutheran Church. As your name is read, please come forward. Joe Fowler, Lanny Fowler, David Funderburg. Dear friends, in baptism, God received you and made you members of his church. The people of this congregation would now like to publicly welcome you into the fellowship of this congregation, praising God for your presence here among us. As a congregation, let us together profess our faith in God using the words of the Apostles' Creed, article by article, as outlined in your bulletin. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lord God of our salvation, we cry out day and night before you. Let our prayer come before you. Incline your ear to our cry. Father, sometimes your word flusters us. We don't like to hear about divine fire or judgment and division. Make us brave and steadfast in faith. Give us ears to rightly hear and hearts to repent. Give us grace to show the fruit of repentant faith to your glory and for the good of your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our make your church a faithful witness to your word. When it must speak of fire, judgment, or sin, let it do so humbly and lovingly, but also honestly and fearlessly. Of it always point to Jesus, the merciful pioneer and perfecter of our faith and our salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Renew the faith, increase the zeal, and strengthen the deeds of everyone in this congregation. Cast the purifying fire of your Holy Spirit in our midst, so that all we say and do is in accordance with your word. Thank you, Lord, for the heritage that has brought us to this day of celebration, and lead us into the future you have for us with trust and boldness. We especially thank you for sending Joe, Lanny, and David to share in kingdom building among us. Help us to be fruitful in all we do. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We are surrounded by a cloud of faithful witnesses, including Christians who are persecuted by worldly strategy and agenda. Strengthen and encourage us by their example. Give them endurance and steadfast hearts. Heal the hearts of all who hate them and you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Establish your peace among all people of this world. Heal, purify, guide, and direct the people and leaders of all the nations in accordance with your will and for our common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Until your peace is established, those for whom Christ died must risk their lives to protect others. Direct their decisions and deeds so that even places of chaos and violence may begin to know your peace. Bring them safely home and bless their hearts and lives with that same peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for everyone who is afflicted by the powers of sin, suffering, and sorrow, especially this day we remember before you, Dot and Libby, Gary, Alan, Chris, Ashley, Carolyn, Peggy, Claudette, Andy, Eric, Pastor Bruce Sheeks, his family, and Emmanuel Lutheran Church, those disillusioned by your church, those fighting cancer, those with COVID, those on our prayer list, and those we name before you now, the family of Jake Cobble. Be their sure hope and strong defender. Strengthen their faith in times of trial. Bring them safely into the fellowship of those who love them and into closer communion with you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we commend our departed loved ones into your care. Keep our faith steadfast and firm in your excellent word until that day when you bring us into your everlasting kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. All this we ask, dear Father, in the power of your spirit. Receive our prayers and grant all that is in accordance with your will for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lanny, Joe, and David, you have made a public profession of your Christian faith along with us. On behalf of this congregation, I now ask you, will you regularly gather here for worship to receive God's word and share in his holy supper? Will you give generously of your time, talent, and treasure in support of the mission of Christ through this congregation? Will you be a servant to others and seek to love your neighbors following in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus? Will you proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and his lordship through your daily words and deeds? If so, please say, I will and I ask God to help and guide me. Will ask God to help me. Please turn and face the congregation. You've been facing the choir. That's part of the congregation. Now we get to face the other ones, right? People of God, will you warmly welcome these brothers and sister in Christ 
Will you pray for them, support them, and work side by side with them in the ministry that we share together as fellow members of the body of Christ? If so, please say, we will, and we ask God to help and guide us. We will, and we ask God to help and guide us. Let's face around back to the altar. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for these men and this woman. By your word and spirit, we pray that we may grow together in mutual ministry and in service of your mission to all the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Christ be with you as we serve together. I do have a bag for you as a couple and for David, for you. It's got some introductory items in it, and it also has an information sheet. We want to get some information further along okay. with you. So let me hand you this. We welcome them with acclamation. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Welcome Thank back. you. Mm -hmm. Announcements-wise, I'll try to make this quick because I know everybody's worried about food. I'm so glad you're here for homecoming, and I'm glad you called me here to be among you here for homecoming. For me, it is a truly different homecoming experience. I mean, I'm used to Southern homecomings, and we did not have that sort of thing in my last call. But this homecoming in this place means an awful lot to me, and I want to say thank you for that. Um, this week's schedule, we forgot to put in on Thursday, and it was an oversight, not intentional. OMG, the Oregon's Men's Group, you're meeting at 6.30 on Thursday. I was told that before worship, so please don't forget about that. Um, we are having the covered dish in the picnic area today. I'm going to ask you, please, please, please wait till people who have roads on can get their food to the table, and we'll say a blessing together before we start. I know everybody just wants to start, but we leave out an awful lot of folks if we just do that. So let's let them don something else and bring their food and join us together, okay? Preference-wise, that's a big deal. Uh, Carolyn's still having some episodes, but we're glad you're here today, and we continue to pray for you, as is Claudette. She's having similar, and so we need to keep them in prayer. Uh, Peggy Butler is back in the hospital. Found that out today. We'll be seeing her later. Gary Daniel, <laughs> I've made jokes with him, but he's had quite a battle with some kidney stones, and he's not done yet, so keep him in prayer. Um... Let's see, Dot, Honeycutt, and Libby. Everybody wants to know how Dot's doing. Not well. One of the biggest things that you can do if you want to be helpful to them is to come and sit with Dot. Um, make sure a small child does not put their finger in a light socket. And let Libby get outside. It's presence that allows her to take a little break as they go through this process. So Dot is okay, but she is preparing. Okay, And so let's all be aware and keep them in prayer. Um, Ashley Sapp. You had a surgery that didn't go quite like it was planned, but we're so glad you're here today, and we'll get to that other part later, and they really did fix some things that needed fixing before the next step, so good for you. So glad. And, of course, Pastor Bruce Sheeks. We pray for him, for Kim, for Charles, for Emmanuel Lutheran Church. He is still hospitalized at Northeast, um, and they're working with him, so um, everyone is gloom and doom. That's not necessarily the case. They're working with him, so just keep praying for him and for them, okay? Uh, da, 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 da. Thank you for beautiful flowers. There are beautiful flowers all around. That's in your bulletin. We talked about soul care. Uh, seventh or eighth graders, Teeny and I want to talk to you. We want to catechize you. Adolphus would be proud. Okay, talk to us. That meeting's coming up. Senior group has a trip August 24. Rita talked to you about the other stuff. Heritage Day, I mentioned that before. Since 10. Any other announcements for the good of the order before we dismiss? Thank you for allowing me to speak differently to you today. It seems to be an appropriate thing for this first year. Know that the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord is making his face to shine upon you and being gracious to you. The Lord is lifting up his countenance upon you and giving you his peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
give you peace at all times and in every way. Thanks be to God. Thank mm-hmm. you. 